there's a tendency against modernity. Mm. With nuclear power, we can bring energy to lots and lots and lots of people because it is so enormously powerful. Whereas with wind turbines and solar panels, we keep things fairly small. We can give a village in Africa a handful of solar panels and, you know, they may make some progress, but not too much, right? This may be the biggest problem with the environmentalists who keep thinking small. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Marco Vischer. Marco is a Dutch journalist and author. He writes for newspapers in the Netherlands and Belgium. He is, in my view, one of the most interesting and critical voices on questions of environmentalism, climate change, progress and optimism. He is the author of The Energy Transition, a book about moving on from fossil fuels in a way that might actually work and be sensible. He's the co-author of Eco-Modernism, a book about eco-modernism. Eco-modernism is a loose movement of environmentalists who want to counter the doom and negativity of modern greens and who argue that humans can protect nature by using technology to limit our impact on the natural world. Marco has been involved in the Dutch Eco-Modernist Society and he is also very pro-nuclear power, an issue he has written about and spoken about widely. Marco, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I want to start by asking you about nuclear power. In one of the pieces you wrote for Spiked last year, you mentioned that there is now a nuclear pride movement and they've even held public get-togethers, which would strike many people as unusual. We're, we're most used to progressives, so-called progressives, marching against nuclear, mm-hmm. whether it was against nuclear weapons in the 1980s or against the idea of nuclear more broadly. So how does someone like you, optimistic, progressive, interested in protecting the environment from too much human harm, Mm -hmm. how did you get to a position where you are favourable towards the great evil, supposedly, (laughs) of nuclear power? Well, I guess because I learned that all these evils that we've heard so much about, that a lot of these things just aren't true. And I was always in favour of solar and wind energy, but I've learned that there are lots of problems with it. Uh, we can talk about that later. Mm. Um, there are probably problems with nuclear as well, but it's the best energy source we have available right now. And it's actually a pretty green energy source. If you consider because of its energy density, it doesn't require so much uh, input. So mm. you have um, just a ping pong ball of uranium is enough to power a, a modern lifestyle, for instance. If you would use coal, you need, uh, what is it, 800 elephants of coal. (laughs) So just to give you an idea. So the footprint of nuclear power is is very, very small. You have clean air with uh, nuclear power plants. Um, There's no CO2 emissions. There's hardly any waste. And the waste that there is, I mean, I I think there is a problem with waste, but it's something we can manage. Mm. Nobody has ever gotten sick or died from nuclear waste it's something we can manage pretty well. Um, we can store it uh, deep under the ground. We may be able to recycle it, actually, and use it as a fuel again, so you have a circular economy. So there are lots of reasons why I think nuclear power is a green energy source and something we should consider using more if we want to tackle uh, the, the climate change. So th- the way you've just described nuclear power there uh, runs very much counter to how lots of people, particularly people involved in the green movement, would talk about nuclear power. So you describe how a very small amount of uranium can power an entire Mm -hmm. human life. Uh, You talk about the fact that even nuclear waste is manageable, the fact that it's clean energy. Uh, The the image we get of nuclear power so often is firstly that it's a potentially very destructive force and can be weaponized to destroy human life, but also that it's, you know, in the post-Chernobyl era, we're supposed to think it's an incredibly destructive force, even if it's used in everyday life. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you saying that's incorrect? And, And if so, how did those myths and falsifications come to be so entrenched mm-hmm. in some people's minds. So it's true that there have been nuclear accidents in the past. There will probably be more nuclear accidents 
in the future. These things happen. There are accidents in every industry. Uh, there are people dying in these industries as well. If you look at nuclear energy, the number of people dying, including, you know, in the mining, um, from the pollution, uh, in accidents, if for nuclear energy, the death toll is really, really, really low. Even if you, you know, take into account uh, Fukushima, nobody died from radiation from the Fukushima accident. There was, of course, the, the tsunami that killed so many people. So it is a safe energy source. That's, that's indisputable. That, that's, that's just a, a fact. I think it's, it's, it's pretty, it's an easy target to raise alarm about because it's something, it's really hard to grasp nuclear energy. I, I mean, it's, it's really complicated uh, stuff if you, mm. if you look into it. And it's something, you know, people tend to be cautious about it. I guess we, we, we've come to confuse nuclear energy with nuclear weapons. Mm. Look at nuclear power plants, perhaps as little nuclear bombs. Somebody told me, I guess that's, that's kind of true. We just, maybe, maybe we even like to be scared of, you know, we have to be scared of something. Mm. So why not be scared <laughs> of nuclear energy? So I want to ask a few more things about nuclear energy in a moment and about renewables and the potential of moving into new energy sources in the future. But I want to take a step back to begin with, because I think what's interesting about quite a few eco-modernists and, you know, some pretty critical green voices that have emerged in recent years is that they've arrived at a pro-nuclear position through taking a more critical approach to the problems of the environment and the problems of climate change, and one which is driven more by a genuine desire to find a solution to some of these problems rather than by a desire to whip up fear and almost develop a kind of religious cult-like uh, atmosphere around the supposed uh, end of the world that climate change will bring about. So could you just describe for us how uh, a little bit of your journey? So you said mm -hmm. you, you were pro wind and pro mm -hmm. uh, yeah. sun. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you start off as a fairly run-of-the-mill environmentalist? And w what happened to bring you to the position mm -hmm. of thinking yeah. that actually technology provides some of the solutions? So I used to work as an editor for uh, a magazine. It used to be called Ode. Now it's called The Optimist. Kind of a green magazine. I wrote a lot about these green issues about sustainability, assuming that you know, everything about wind energy was great. Everything about solar energy was great. Uh, and of course, everything about nuclear energy was terrible. <laughs> um, so I, I wrote all these things and then I started to doubt a little. I saw that we didn't make much progress in tackling climate change, which was a problem that I considered to be a real problem. And actually, <laughs> my changing about climate change keep changing as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I guess I became a bit of a lukewarmer over time, thinking, well, okay, there may be problems, but not all the consequences of climate change will be, will be so bad as so many people think. Mm -hmm. I now get to believe that climate change is accelerating, actually, and um, that we ought to be more worried. So again, my, my, my thinking is never, uh, it's, it's set it's changing. in, it's, it, it keeps evolving. Yeah. I guess so. And I, I just recognize that wind and solar won't be able to solve climate change, mm. um, by themselves. It's, they produce too little energy. They are reliable on, they still rely on coal and gas because solar panels only work when the sun shines wind turbines only work when the wind blows so and because we don't have batteries to back up we have to rely on uh, on fossil fuel plants to provide energy we live in a world where billions of people will be added this century we're now at seven and a half billion people we will go up to 10 11 billion people this century world economy will keep rising especially in poor countries and we should be thankful for that uh, world energy use will rise tremendously, maybe by 40% uh, by half the century, 2050. So we will need a lot more energy and we can hardly keep up with, uh, with the growing demand for energy. For that, you need something much stronger than solar and wind. And I think nuclear is a, is a way to get there. Mm. It's, uh, it, it, would you think it would be fair to say that I mean, there are many, many approaches to climate change, but it seems to me that in the green movement, there's really a very clear divide between those who approach climate change as 
who see it as an indictment of progress and see it as proof that mankind is a largely destructive force and the only option is to rein mankind in have fewer children, have less progress, don't even think about development in the third world and so on. And then there's this other side, which unfortunately is tends to be a more of a, a minority view, which tends to view climate change as something that's happening, as you say, and something which is a problem and maybe a big problem, a small problem, however they conceive of it, but who see it as a practical challenge rather than as something which suggests that we have to unwind all the gains that have really taken place since mm -hmm. the Industrial Revolution and in the modern period. So do you think that's a fair description of one of the key divides in the environmental yeah, movement? Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. I hear so many demands coming from the Green Movement to tear down capitalism or keep raising awareness. And once we have enough people whose awareness have been raised, then, then we will be able to tackle all these problems because then we live uh, sober, sober lifestyles. But I don't think that's going to bring us anywhere. Basically, it's sort of luxury to think that that is an option. It is an option in, you know, in Western Europe to use less energy, for instance, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, maybe grow your own food if you have, if you enjoy growing your own <laughs> organic tomatoes. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's all wonderful, but it's not a way, you know, to feed billions of people, mm -hmm. to bring energy to billions and billions of people. It, it's a romantic idea. We, we kind of like to think that, you know, nature is, is fantastic, but nature has been pretty cruel to humanity. And, and it's fantastic that we were able to actually be, a, you know, to, to dominate, uh, nature and, um, not so much that we have to destruct it or anything. That's not necessary at all. It's probably a byproduct of progress that we have been doing these kind of things, you know, polluting water, polluting the air, but it's actually by, by growing even more and using more and better technology that we'll be able to fix these problems because then we'll have the resources for it uh, with the growing welfare. We'll be able to have people demand uh, a better care for the environment. Whereas now, you know, a lot of people simply struggle mm. to, to have, to bring their kids to school, for instance, and get proper uh, medical care. Mm. Okay. So I want to ask you about Eco-modernism. Now, I know eco-modernism is a pretty diverse movement. The people involved or around the eco-modernist movement don't all have the exact same views, mm -hmm. uh, either politically or environmentally either. So how, how do you understand it? Because I've always thought that there is, at the heart of eco-modernism, there's an interesting, possibly an interesting contradiction, which on the one hand, there are people who are conservationists who would like to conserve parts of the natural world or, or at least not have too much radical change in parts of the natural world. But at the same time, there's a lot of optimists and, and a lot of optimists in the movement who are particularly optimistic about progress and the mm. ability of progress to address the problems we currently face and also to um, create a even better, bigger, newer world. So do you see that as a contradiction between conservationists and progressive optimists? Or do you think that just makes it a more <laughs> fruitful, interesting eco-movement? Well, it is interesting, absolutely, that eco-modernists have shown to to bring people together who would have otherwise never met and agreed on on certain things. So I think that is, it's interesting that the green movement is growing in a sense. I see eco-modernism as part of the green, green movement. And in a sense, uh, speaking to people who may not have been so fond of uh, of the greens. And I don't, I don't see the contradiction that you see I think there is a um, there's a growing group of people who who see an inherent value in in nature and want to protect it and, mm. and conserve it, um, and it's totally possible within demand for more economic growth. It's actually the countries with economic growth that are more able to conserve nature, to to have more protected land area, more protected nature, uh, to clean the air, clean the waterways. That's what we do with more economic growth. So it's, it's, it's perfectly, it goes perfectly together. Maybe one thing that, that is different from, for eco-modernists compared to the more traditional greens is that as eco-modernists, we want to, we want to strive for human development. And that is something that the greens probably will not accept that they don't do that so much. Mm. But if development can only be sustainable, can only take place when nature does not, you know, in a way suffer, then human development is not as important, it seems. 
And I think eco-modernists are well aware that human development and, and human suffering at this moment is an urgent problem that we need to tackle. And that is more important, I think, than, than, than saving some species of frogs and, mm. and birds, no matter how wonderful frogs and birds are. Mm. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast and Spike's other podcasts, and also the articles and essays that Spike publishes every day, please think about giving us a donation. Spike's content is free, and we want to keep it free, and donations really help us to do that. Head over to Spike's donation page now at www.spiked-online.com. It's interesting that you say that the eco-modernists see themselves as part of the broader green family, because mm-hmm. I think one of the interesting things about the past few years and the past few months as well is that we had this rise of the eco-modernist outlook over the past 10 years or so, and various green thinkers and green activists thinking about the question of human progress, technology, how we can improve human life and also protect the environment. Very positive development. But at the same time, particularly over the past few months, it does look like the broader environmentalist movement is going backwards. So I'm thinking of the rise of Extinction Rebellion, for example, which on the one hand is, you know, it's not the whole green movement, but one of the striking things about it is how sympathetic so many greens and politicians Mm -hmm. and media commentators have been towards this movement, which is quite striking considering that it's a movement with pretty extreme demands for the reduction Mm -hmm. of fossil fuel use by a particular time. They would be very skeptical of economic growth or certainly a huge amount of economic growth. So how do you conceive of Extinction Rebellion? How do you view Mm -hmm. Extinction Rebellion? And would you say that it demonstrates that environmentalism is is losing the plot. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I see what you mean. I should say that in the Netherlands, Extinction Rebellion has not been so big as it is here in London, I think. (laughs) Over here, they've actually taken over what was the the public transit, right? Uh, Which is, I believe, an electric system, right? (laughs) So (laughs) it's kind of of an odd thing to do here. (laughs) Yeah, in the Netherlands, it's not such a big movement, um, I should say. I think... From what I've seen, the more radical actions here in in London, I think these are actions that will not attract the sympathy of a lot of people. I think it will attract the sympathy from the commentators in the newspapers, from liberal media, liberal politicians, I guess, but not so much from people on the street yeah. who will come late to their appointment and, and stuff like <laughs> that. Yeah, it, it's as simple as that, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen that quite clearly. I mean, there were actual bust ups in London between ordinary people and Extinction Rebellion activists. That's but interesting. It, it, one of the things that you've spoken about and written about is, is the way in which the green movement in recent years has veered towards, uh, well, for quite a long time, it's been veering towards a view of the world based on the idea of scarcity the idea of limitations, the idea of there's only a certain amount humanity can do, there's only a certain number of resources humanity can use, and then it's game over. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think eco-modernists, in keeping with progressives throughout modern times, in fact, think more in terms of abundance, creation, a far more positive approach. So what would you say to those Greens who believe very deeply, and I meet these kind of people all the time, that resources are scarce, we're using them all up, and there will come a tipping point, there will become a, mm-hmm. a peak something or other, after which there's nothing left and we all die of starvation yeah. in some yeah, dystopian yeah. future. How do you challenge those ideas be, of scarcity? There has to be a peak, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's an, this thinking has been around and has been probably growing, especially in the 1970s yeah. with the Club of Rome report, the limits to growth. But these reports and these predictions of depleting resources, they, they've been written without the, the, the notion, it seems, that we are capable of finding more resources, finding other places where these resources may be, finding other ways to attract these resources, use them more efficiently and recycle them, which is what we have been doing for decades, uh, and also finding alternatives. Because at one point, indeed, when resources uh, dry up, then we do find alternatives, Mm. usually cleaner ones and cheaper ones. And this has been the story of of resources. It's a secret story of resources, if you will. 
yes, we keep using them, but we use less of them. And, and that this is what we especially see in, in more developed countries where we use fewer resources while uh, growing economically. And this is a radical trend from everything we've seen in the past. This is the decoupling that mm. eco-modernists like to talk about so much. This is where we, we grow, but, but save nature, basically. Mm. And this is what we, it is possible. Mm. We are seeing it right now. I think that's uh, actually a good description of, of one of the problems of pessimistic thinking more broadly in the modern era, because this predates even the contemporary green movement and even the contemporary conservationist movement. Did this failure to factor into the equation humanity's ability to make discoveries and humanity's ability to think anew about what could be a resource, what couldn't be a resource and so on. I mean, the good example I always think about is in Roman times when people used coal to make bits of jewellery because it would glint in an interesting ah, way in the nice. sun. And then you fast forward however many centuries and suddenly we discover that coal contains this trapped light which can be unleashed and used to power all sorts of transport and, and modern energy. So th that failure to think about humanity's role, not simply in using things mm -hmm. and destroying things, but also creating. Do you think that springs from, in, in terms of the environmentalist movement, do you think that comes from an older form of pessimism and an older anti-progressive outlook? Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, thinking about progress has been pretty unusual for a, a long period in human history because not there wasn't much yeah. progress. <laughs> there was suffering and poverty and, and illness all along. And then suddenly around, what is it, 17, 1800 or so, things started to change first slowly, but actually pretty quickly. And everything, everything changed. We got richer, we lived longer lives in all of a sudden, you know, going from, what was it, 100 years ago, the average life ex expectancy was, I guess, 30 years. Now it's over 70. In Western Europe, it's over 80. So these things are spreading throughout the world, but it's fairly new and we have to, <laughs> we're still getting used to it, I guess. And the whole idea of progress is runs counter mm. to, to, to what we, to our instincts, I guess. Mm. So in relation to, you mentioned that you were an editor at Ode magazine, mm -hmm. which then became the optimist mm -hmm. and you have described yourself as an optimist and people like Matt Ridley describe themselves as yep. rational optimists. And you just mentioned there one of the more tangible measurements of progress, which is life expectancy, which has rocketed in this period yeah. in which apparently we're destroying everything and, and ruining human life. What causes for optimism? How would you describe the case for optimism to those who, particularly those in the green movement, who do come off as incredibly mm -hmm. pessimistic and uh, even quite irrationally fearful? Mm -hmm. How would you describe to them the causes of for optimism, the, the, the argument for optimism and the proof that it is probably yep. pretty sensible to be optimistic yep. about human life. Well, just to start with the proof, we are wealthier, healthier, we live longer, we live in more peaceful times, we're more tolerant, we're freer, we're more equal than we were ever before. And it's, as you say, authors like Matt Ridley, who have written about this, uh, there's Stephen Pinker from Harvard, from Sweden, we have Hans Rosling with his famous TED Talks, we have Johan Norberg coming from Sweden. This has been established very, very well, and it's hardly disputed. Now, the interesting thing is what, what has contributed to all this progress, and it's probably a couple things, but the free exchange of ideas is probably most important. This is very much part of the, of Matt Ridley's book, The Rational mm. Optimist. Ideas have sex. Yeah. <laughs> when, when ideas are having sex, yeah. it's when, you know, when people work, they cooperate, they do things that they're good at, and they work together with people who are good at other things. And this is what has made progress. If we do that in a relatively free society, when there's some sort of free markets, probably not 100% free or so, uh, but free enough for people to engage with each other, when there's some sort of free movement of people, when there's an open debate going on, when we can test ideas in the scientific matter, that's when you get progress. And when all these things are in a way under under threat, right? Because mm. the, the open debate, free speech is under threat coming from different directions, I guess. But, you know, there are people out there who want to rein in the, the free debate. 
shut people down from participating in uh, in public debate. This is not a good trend. This is mm. something we should stand up against because we know that an open debate contributes to progress. Not that every idea is so good, yeah. <laughs> but we know that that an open debate is uh, is something to be to be cherished and yeah. to be conserved. Absolutely. And the same goes for democracy. Same goes for science. One of the key uh, motors of progress is having a space in which people can think in a new way, think in an eccentric way, take intellectual risks and take scientific risks. And the more that that gets shut down, then the le less likely progress becomes. So on that very issue, you mentioned there um, science. And one of the problems with contemporary environmentalism is the way it talks about science. To begin with, it often says the science. So it gives it this kind of definitive, almost godlike aura. And It seems to me, you know, the, they would argue, for example, Greta Thunberg will often say she is simply representing the science. She's simply giving voice to the science. And I've seen environmentalists marching in London behind a banner that says, listen to the science. How do you think about that? The way in which they use the science to justify their arguments, which I think is slightly different to saying, here are the facts of how we've impacted on the climate. And it becomes mm -hmm. something almost religious. Eco-modernists like science yeah. as well. <laughs> so it's more like my science is better than your <laughs> science, right? So we start a contest. Now, there is something of a judgment following as well, of course, and setting priorities. I guess, well, maybe go back to, to climate science uh, and climate change. You know, in the beginning, I was saying that my, my thinking evolves a bit there. I can understand that there are certain drivers for climate scientists to maybe exaggerate their point a little bit just because it's easier for them to get funding if they tweak their computer model just a little bit so we get a little bit more warming and we get more and more problems. I, I, I understand that that's part of it. I understand that it's mostly people who are already concerned about climate change who get involved as a climate scientist. So that may contribute as well to all these stories full of concerns about changing climate. I can see there is a community. It, it, it's a fairly new, relatively new science still. But there's a community, so you don't want to be the one who goes against all mm. these kind of things. So I can recognize all this, but still, I guess we have to trust that the science, with a capital T still, Brennan, <laughs> <laughs> has determined that climate change is a problem mm. and that we should be, that we should act soon. Mm. So I agree there with the traditional greens. And I do see that some of them use very alarmist tone. I think most eco-modernists will agree that we've seen enough of that already and that there's no need to be so alarmist and that we should get uh, pragmatic about solutions, but that science can actually guide us. I, th I think we, we agree there. <laughs> I, I think one of the problems in relation to the way in which some greens use the science is that the science becomes not simply something that can inform us about how the climate is changing and what role we, we might be playing in that, but also becomes the thing that determines how we should respond. So I think the more that sci the science becomes politicized, the more it becomes not simply a guide, as you d aptly mm -hmm. describe it, but uh, a gospel in the sense that the science shows this and therefore we must stop doing all mm -hmm. these other things. Yeah. Whereas, and I think what that misses out is actually the key part of this whole discussion, which is the question of human need, the question of moral and political judgment, and also the question of democracy and the possibility mm -hmm. that a nation, yeah. a nation might fully understand, for example, a nation like China, not a good example, let's say India, because India is actually a democracy. <laughs> so India, people there, many people there will fully understand that as India progresses more and more, it will go through some very difficult, polluting, dirty, mm -hmm. environmentally risky uh, processes, but they might democratically decide that that's a price worth paying mm -hmm. uh, in order to achieve progress. So I think one of the problems with the science is that it becomes a crutch Uh, or, uh, it becomes a substitute for talking about what human beings need yeah. and what human beings want. Yeah. Now I can I can surely recognize that. Um, you could also say the science has shown that nuclear power is currently mm. the best available energy source we have to tackle climate change in time. That's also true. It's also true that I forget the exact numbers, but I think you will need to build one nuclear power plant every day until what what is it, twenty fifty or so. 
in order to avo- avoid climate change. But that's not going to happen, of course. <laughs> if, if we build, I don't know, 10 every year, that will be, we're doing a good job yeah. <laughs> at, that, at that. And this is where democracy comes in as well. Yeah. In Western Europe, at least, people do not want nuclear energy. And I think it's important, therefore, that people speak out for in favor of, uh, of, of nuclear energy. But I mean, in the Netherlands, we have seen quite some dramatic protests against wind turbines, um, even with, you know, uh, asbestos uh, dumpings on fields, people sending threatening letters, intimidations going very, very far, arrests have been made. But this may be nothing compared to, you know, once you actually plan to build a nuclear power plant in the Netherlands. Because then these protests will be backed by large environmental organizations. There will be a lot of politicians gaining points from poking fear about nuclear energy. So this is a problem. And I guess I sometimes wonder energy is so, is such a basic need. Do we need people to talk about all this? Right. What the perfect energy mix is? Or should we decide very, you know, by technocrats? Okay. This is the correct energy mix for this country. Let's do it. I don't know. I I wonder about that every now and then. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. Subscribe now so that you never miss an episode. And it would be great if you could give us a rating and maybe even a review. That is a really good way to help new listeners discover the show. I always think of the example of the expansion of Heathrow Airport, which has taken decades and decades simply to agree it, never mind to actually get on with it, and it won't be done for a long time. Uh, whereas in China, they can build an airport that's the, the same size as an English town in the space of three years. And that's largely because, I mean, it's not simply because Britain is a democracy and China isn't, but it also is because China is is lacking some of the red tape and so on yep. that we have. Now, red tape is not always bad. Health and safety are important factors, especially for workers. But there is that question of, it, there's a sense of lethargy in many Western nations, a sense of a, a lack of curiosity or commitment to the idea of progress more broadly. But, mm-hmm. but I wanted to ask you about the energy question in a bit more detail. So you've written The Energy Transition mm-hmm. and you are keen that we uh, move on from reliance on fossil fuels. Just to begin with, can you can you just say a bit more? You, you've already mentioned the inefficiency of wind and yeah. solar, but can you just say a bit more about uh, why they are inefficient? Because it, it, I think that's as you say, it's important that we make the argument for nuclear, but it's also that important that we make the argument against mm-hmm. the idea that those energy forms yeah. will save humankind. So, yeah. to greens who who say all the time, let's put solar panels everywhere, let's have windmills everywhere. How would you counter that, uh, mm-hmm. uh, demonstrating to them that this is not going to yeah. save humankind? Yeah. yeah, Well, these energy sources are fairly dilute, if you will. You will need a <clears throat> lot of solar panels and a lot of wind turbines to get the energy that we actually need to have. We're going to have to build them somewhere. We usually build them in natural landscapes. I should say in a small, densely populated country as the Netherlands, that is kind of difficult. Yeah. We have you know, a fair chunk of North Sea, but that's being used for other purposes as well. And the land, it's its hard to build any wind turbine now without people complaining because mm. they will come very close to your home and this is not what people want. I should say that there are large, large chunks of uh, desert in, in Africa, but also in the southwest of the United States that are in Australia, not to mention Australia, where you can build large solar farms without people having so much problems with it. Not even, there may be some uh, turtles or so uh, <laughs> involved that we may have to replace or uh, put them, migrate is I yeah. guess the word, put them someplace else. But that can that can be solved, I guess. But it's just not every country is perfectly fit for solar and wind, and especially in Northern uh, Europe. It's probably not a very good uh, mm. idea to do. You can put them on your roofs, but give up nature and, and the farmland to start building uh, solar farms and uh, and have big wind farms. I don't think that's such a good idea. They take up a lot of space that we could give back to to nature. 
there's always somebody whenever I speak at conferences or so, there's always somebody standing up and talks about the birds and bats. Well, that's true as well. Um, usually I should say it's someone who doesn't really care about birds at all. Yeah. He just doesn't want to have <laughs> wind turbines <laughs> and has discovered maybe that, uh, the bird, uh, is, uh, something that could draw sympathy for, for his cause. And anyway, we do know that birds do suffer from, from wind turbines. And if we want to, we want these things because we want to do something for nature. But if the consequences are that we use a lot of nature in the end and we kill birds and bats, then we should reconsider all these things. And yeah. they take up a lot of resources. And after 20, 20, maybe 25 years, you will have to tear them down. Where does all this stuff go? There will probably be programs for that. Maybe we could recycle some of the stuff. But, you know, <laughs> let's make a comparison to nuclear uh, power plant then. These have life cycles of 80 years or so, maybe even longer. So, yeah, I just wonder <laughs> what the environmental cause was for for, yeah. uh, for wind and solar in the first place. Yeah. One of the, as you've just said, one of the most uh, striking and ironic things about the kind of pro-wind, pro-solar lobbies is that they don't seem to realize, or maybe they don't seem to care that these things actually take up more natural space and you know i usually see these things if i'm flying into a country and then suddenly when you're approaching the coast you see you know loads and loads mm -hmm. and loads of windmills in the sea and you know it often looks quite beautiful and striking but it is an intervention in the natural world and the same with solar farms and wind turbines on land as well so on the nuclear question then just to dig into that in a bit more detail because one of the arguments you make is that the simplest way i think for us to move from fossil fuels to a new era is to really mm. explore and take seriously yeah. the nuclear option the hostility to nuclear power which we've talked about uh, beyond the kind of fear-mongering that exists and the impact of chernobyl which was exaggerated but it's had a huge impact on western consciousness and it's become this kind of mm -hmm. figurehead moment in terms of uh alongside some of the events of the 1970s before it as well do you think that the hostility to nuclear power speaks to something more than that though it maybe it speaks to the environmentalist movement's broader suspicion of human intervention in nature so it's not simply that they are worried about the impact and worried about the waste and all mm -hmm. these other things but but underlying it there is this reluctance to allow humankind to be so hubristic and mm -hmm. interventionist and arrogant mm -hmm. that he presumes that he can behave in a godlike way yep. in relation to uranium and progress yeah, and everything yeah. else even though uranium is very natural right <laughs> <laughs> it's in the ground that's that's probably so i i guess i would add uh there's a tendency just against modernity mm. basically with nuclear power we can bring energy to lots and lots and lots of people because it is so enormously powerful whereas with wind turbines and solar panels we keep things fairly small we can give a village in africa um, a handful of solar panels and they may be you know they may make some progress but not too much right and this is i think this may be the biggest problem mm -hmm. with the, the, the environmentalists who keep thinking small. Yeah. They're basically the, the, the smallest beautiful book by E.F. Schumacher is the essential, uh, environmentalist book, right? And it, it is pretty radical if, if you read it. it. I mean, all the movements were always about growing bigger and, and taking more power, usually political power, whether it was left or right. Mm. And then there was a green ideology of going back and downscaling. And this is probably something that is very much part of the environmental movement. I sh should add here that the environmental movement, what are we talking about when, when we talk about environmentalists, right? It's usually... It's a small group, but they have sympathy from a growing group yeah. of people who think, oh, they, they must be right because yeah. they, they care about the earth and about the environment. So I do too. They have my sympathy, but it's really a small group of environmentalists, I guess, who would actually advocate for going back to the land and, and for smallness. But it, because they have so much sympathy from more mainstream, this may be the direction we'd be going into. Mm. 
And I think that is a very wrong mm. direction because it will not help people and eventually it will not help nature. Yeah. Uh, and one of the problems with it, I think, which you've touched upon is the relationship that it develops between Western liberals or Western so-called progressives and the underdeveloped parts of the world, because then it becomes frequently, you know, for example, at the Extinction Rebellion protest in London, um, I saw activists handing out leaflets that said, literally contain the words, Africa is on fire, which not only is that untrue, uh, Africa is not on fire at all. And Africa is a huge, diverse continent. Mm -hmm. Some countries are doing pretty well and other countries are not doing very well. But also there is this increasing method among some Western Greens who tend to come from fairly privileged parts of society to suggest that growth overseas is a problem. The Chinese leap forward, mm -hmm. not the bad leap forward, but the more recent, more positive one is a bad thing. India's growth is a bad thing. Uh, Brazil is destroying its own rainforest and maybe we need to send in some Western soldiers mm -hmm. to stop them from doing so. D do you see almost like a neo-colonial aspect to certain arguments mm -hmm. that are used in relation to progress in the third world? Well, yeah, but probably only for a, a small part. Yeah. If, if you spell it out, especially the way you spell it out, this is not, this is not drawing support from a lot of people, of course. Uh, but it may be that there is an underlying idea that, um, that we do not want to have other people, billions of people who develop in the way that we do. It's, it may not even be that, uh, it may not even be so that we don't want them to prosper. It may be that we feel guilty that we are the ones who, who have prospered mm -hmm. just by, you know, being born in the right place at the right time. It could be that we are deeply uncomfortable. We as a society, I mean, that we are deeply uncomfortable with that and do not know how to, how to behave and how to think about these issues. My point would be, Let's give them what we have and let's stimulate all this and bring the openness and, and the market and, and the democracy there. Bring it n not so much by sending in soldiers to bring it, but, <laughs> but, but, but by stimulating it and, and making a case for it that this is a good way forward, that this will make a, a big leap forward, basically, as yeah. you say. So I don't know if it's so much that we, we do not, that it's neo-colonialism. I, that w those would not be my words. Mm. In relation to one of the things that you've written about is um, the tendency towards doom mongering that does exist among sections mm -hmm. of the green movement. And, you know, sometimes it's mild doom mongering. They will say, you know, we have to achieve net carbon emissions by 2050 or else we're in trouble. Sometimes it's pretty extreme doom mongering and this idea that, um, well, the idea that Africa is on fire or the idea that the Brazilian rainforest is disappearing and, and other things, which, you know, Michael Schellenberger and others have demonstrated mm -hmm. is just not correct. And I think Greens, some Greens make the mistake of thinking that doom-like scenarios will be a way of galvanizing people, mm -hmm. but often it can have the opposite effect. I think it can kind yeah. of suppress the human desire to do something good. And, and uh, Well, it can be stimulating in the short term, yeah. I think. But if we keep on doom-mongering, especially if we keep doom-mongering about the same things, <laughs> then, the, then it probably stops working at a certain point. This is what I hear from people like Matt Ridley and Stephen Pinker and so forth, but they don't have the proof that this is actually what is happening. It looks like we people keep being galvanized by these uh, doom mongers in the end, I think, because mm. if it were true, we would be, we would be fed up with greens by now, but mm. the contrary is true, right? So, mm. so I guess that we like to to hear some kind of doom and that we yeah the, and this is what the news is as well right i mean apart yeah. from from environmentalist i mean we enjoy reading articles about things going bad and you know tv programs showing how terrible things are yeah this is what we like yeah and we have for <laughs> and we keep liking it a long time <laughs> in relation to that one of the things that i find interesting or, or worth thinking about is is which constituencies in society are more amenable to this kind of stuff. Because I think my personal view is that one of the interesting things about the emergence of Extinction Rebellion and, and the Greta Thunberg phenomenon and this quite radical doom that has emerged over the past six months or a year, to me, it looks like a pretty strange reaction to the growth of populist politics. So in recent times, 
You had the emergence of populist ideas, Brexit, various populist movements in the Netherlands and across Europe and in the US too. And it does look like there's a pushback against that coming from environmentalism, but like on steroids. So there's kind Mm. of quite fearsome movement that's coming in and saying, don't forget the experts, don't forget the science, don't forget the technocrats, don't forget the fact the world's coming to an end. And that's more Mm. important than Brexit. A slogan we hear in the UK Mm. all the time is climate change is more important than Brexit, which looks to me like a pushback against the popular idea for Brexit. So in in relation to this um, appetite for doom that mm-hmm. you mentioned, which I think is absolutely true and has existed for as long as humankind have existed, the kind of the temptation mm-hmm. for, for scary stories, end of the world scenarios, do you think that works across society or do you think it tends to be among ironically, often among educated people and, and well-connected people, or do you think it's a mm-hmm. universal? When, when I hear you talk about populists, I think about them as doom mongers as well. They just spread doom about immigrants mm. overflowing their countries and taking over, um, which is an exaggeration as well, of course, because this is not at all happening and there are reforms happening in Islam communities and everything. But it's 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 a strange thing happening right now that on the right, the populists, they spread fear about immigrants, but they don't have any fear about climate change because they consider that a hoax and, and, and we don't need to do anything about it. And on the other side, on the, on the green left poll, there you see people who spread fear about climate change and about loss of biodiversity, but they do not fear the rise of immigrants mm. in Western Europe. So it's like, We all need to have some kind of pessimistic idea of being overrun by whatever it is, whether you're left or right. Yeah, I think that's very true. There are uh, politics today often looks like competing narratives of fear Mm -hmm. and all sides become very enamored with their own fearful predictions mm-hmm. and and skeptical of any other mm-hmm. <laughs> fearful prediction that is made by anyone else. Yeah. Okay, the final thing I want to ask you is you're an optimist. I'm pretty optimistic too. So are you optimistic about the broader human project or are you optimistic that practically at some point people will realize that nuclear power <laughs> offers lots of <laughs> solutions that, uh, you know, within the space of 50 mm-hmm. years or so, we could really radically transform the planet and, mm-hmm. re- and solve the problems of, of environmental mm-hmm. destruction and pollution and so on. I guess my question is, is your mm-hmm. optimism abstract? in the sense that you just have a general feeling of optimism towards the goodness Mm -hmm. of humankind? Or is it a tangible, practical optimism that you think things will progress at some point in the next few decades? Or both? Well, it could could be both. Things will probably progress in the next coming decades. But I am sometimes pessimistic about the things we do, especially in Western Europe. I think here we are, we may be losing the causes for all this, pro- for all the progress, we might be losing free speech and mm. a sense of democracy and popular demand. We may be losing the sense that progress is a good thing, something worth fighting for. We may even be start thinking that science is not such a wonderful thing after all. We may start doubting science and become more superstitious about certain things or, or some quasi religious in a quasi religious way. This may seem abstract to you, by the way, (laughs) I understand that. But this is the place where we we should keep developing these Mm. ideas. And if we start losing it, it probably will rise up in some other places because there's nothing typical Western about any of these ideas, right? Mm. These Mm. were all universal ideas. But they will have to spring up at other places in order to keep humanity progressing. Mm. And, And I notice I'm sometimes a bit pessimistic about our uh, about our ability to actually uh, keep fighting for for the things that will bring us progress marco thank you very much okay. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.